Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Bhagavatra Daf Kufdalid. Today is October 7th. It's hard to believe it's been a year since this tragic day. Sadly, we are still grappling with its aftermath. We continue to pray for the release of all the hostages, for the safety of the soldiers on the front lines, for the safe return of all those displaced from their homes, for the full recovery of injured soldiers, and comfort for those mourning the loss of close family or friends. We also pray for the safety of those living under constant rocket attacks as we even heard just before class this morning, and the list goes on. May this year bring peace and better days for Am Yisrael. Okay, um, we're going to get started with our, a review of the Mishnah from Daf Kuf Gimel. And I made some pictures which will help you to understand all the mathematics of it. So I'm going to share my screen right now, and we will look at the pictures. So, well, actually, before we look at the pictures for a quick minute, let's just talk about the two cases the mission discussed. The mission discussed that you sold a bait core of a fowl, that means a field or an area that could be used as a field, that is 30 se'a. Okay, we're going to talk about all these amounts. Um, but you said either midah bechevel, exact measurements, or you said hen chaser hen yeter, which, you know, more or less, give or take. So if you said midah b'chevel, as measured by the rope, which is what they use to measure things, we learned that if you remember with the, with the Tchum Shabbat, they would measure it with this rope, or we learned it with all different situations, I think Egla Rufa also. Um, if there's any discrepancy whatsoever, it goes back, okay? So if I, as a buyer, got too much land, if, if the seller said midah b'chevel, exact measurements, we return any extra. But... And that's the case we're going to mostly deal with. If we said, hen chaser hen yeter, give or take, more or less, then any, we assume there's a certain amount, what we call the margin of error, that basically I get to keep, okay? Or if I got too little, then I can't really complain about. So what is that amount? Okay, so for here, we're going to look at the pictures. The amount we said is a quarter kav per se'a. That's the amount. So let's talk about the se'a and kav because those are two different measurements. So there's six kav in a se'a. So what I did here is I made these six boxes, which basically shows one se'a equals six kav. So this is this box is one se'a, which is six kav. What I did in the picture on the left is I divided those six boxes, each one into quarters, because we really want a quarter kav. So each, each kav within the se'a is now into fours. So if we do, if we what I did is in yellow, I did one of the quarter of one of the kavim that are in these six kavim, which make up the se'a, which basically means we have 24 quarters in that box. It's very simple if you look at the picture now, because each se'a has six kav, and each kav has four quarters. So four times six is 24. And if we take a quarter, one quarter kav out of that, that's one in 24. And that's the amount that the Mishnah gives that's the margin of error that we accept. We assume it means that whoever buys or sells gives up on this amount, up to and including a quarter cup for every se'a. So now if we move to a field that's a core, which is the bottom picture, okay, what I did here is each box here is basically like one of these boxes of a of a of a ka, of a se'a, okay, right? These boxes above are se'ot, and this little yellow over here is one in 24 of that whole big box. So what I did here is I did it in red just so it's more noticeable. Each box of these 30 boxes, okay, we have 30 boxes because one core is 30 se'ot. Each box is a se'a, and each red dot is 1 24th. Okay, I can't say it's exactly to scale, but I tried to make it look like 1 24 is a little teeny corner of that. So if we have in each, okay, again, this doesn't have to be in each one exactly. It's not like you take the field and put it into boxes, but the amount per, basically we have 30 of these little red dots, 1 24th of every se'a in, these, in this field. If we took all those quarters and we added them up, you would get to one quarter times 30 because there's a quarter kav in each of these se'ot that we can assume margin of error. We multiply a quarter by 30, you get to seven and a half. And that's how the mission gets this number, seven and a half kavim. So up to seven and a half kav in a field that's 30 se'ah, that's what we assume that each side gives up. Okay, those are the basic numbers you have to know. 
There's one other very important number, which is, so now let's assume I bought this field and you gave me that amount extra or that amount less, okay? So if we take all those red dots and we stick them together and that's a clump of land. So if it's that amount, and let's say it's in addition to the core or it's less than the core, then we assume that we're both okay with that, okay? Either that way or that way, one of us, right? The seller's okay if, he, if the seller gave me too much. The, I'm okay as the buyer if I got that amount less. But more than that, now the main case we're gonna talk about is if I got more land than that, then we give it back and what did we say? We give it all back, okay? So basically, up to that extra amount, I got an addition, up to seven and a half kaf, we basically assume I get to keep. If I go over and I get to 7.6 or eight kav, let's say, then I have to give it all back. But there's a problem because between 7.6 and nine kav, you have nothing to do with that land, okay? So I can't give you back the land because it's not a significant piece of land. That was what the Mishnah said. So I can't give you back that land. What do we do then? I pay you for it, okay? Because I paid you for a core. I didn't pay you for the extra eight kabim. So now I have to pay you for the extra eight kabim. Now, even though at seven and a half, you were okay with it, as soon as we get beyond the seven and a half, then I have to, then we assume there's no mochila at all. You're not mochil on seven and a half, but not on the extra half kav. No. Once you go over, it's like going bust, and right, I have to pay the entire amount. And that's what the Mishnah had basically set up. So now I need to basically give back the surplus, only the surplus. All the eight kabim now, assuming it's eight kabim, let's say, I have to give back all eight kav. I keep the field, I give back the surplus. Now the question is, what if it's nine kav? Once we get to nine kav, that's, oh, no, I have to give back all nine kav. But normally we'd say I have to pay. And, the, and what we learned in the Mishnah is, the seller can insist I pay because the seller, right? The seller can really decide if the seller wants a little piece of land, let them take it. But when we get to nine kav, that's already a minimum size of a field. So I, as the buyer, can say, take back the field, okay? I don't have to pay, okay? So between 7.6 and nine, okay? Again, this is all assuming the, the, the field is a core, okay? That's our measurements. So between seven point, because seven point six, 0.5 is the relevant number for a core. It would be 15, let's say, if it's two core. It would be half that amount if it's half, okay, a core. So now, up to seven and a half for the core, everything stays the same, nothing happens. 7.6, I have to pay, unless the seller says I want the land back. But if the seller doesn't want the land back, I have to pay the 7.6 or the eight or the 8.5, when it gets to nine though, if we measure it and we find out that I got nine kav extra, then the nine kav I can give you back as land, okay? Or if it's a gina, if it's a garden, chatsi kav or rova kav, depending on the machloket and what you think the minimum size of a garden is. Okay, a garden is more like a field is where you can plant grains and because there's no water flowing through, if there's a lot of water flowing through, then already you can plant like a garden, which could be trees, like a, a, an orchard, something like that. So the size there is different because, first of all, trees, right? You can get a lot more in a smaller amount of space, and therefore it's a different measurement. But then I can insist on giving it back to you. That's basically the Mishnah. So the Gemara starts off with a very kind of easy question or basic question, which is, the Mishnah gave two cases. Either I said, Midah Bechevel, measuring, you know, or you said, because I was the buyer, the seller said, I'm selling you a field and I'm measuring it out exactly, or they said more or less, and there was a different halacha for each one. But what if he bailei bait core stamamai? What if we just said bait core? What about if I didn't say mida bechevel, or I didn't say hen chaserin yeter, you just said as the seller, I'm selling you a bait core. What do we do? Is it like hen chaserin yeter? Do we assume you meant more or less? or do we assume you meant exact measurement? So the Gemara is going to do a very classic, um, this is a very typical thing we see a lot, where they're going to say, oh, well, the first case in the Mishnah said only midah So you can assume stam would be the opposite. 
But then they're going to say, what about the second case? You can infer the opposite of that. And then they're going to say, okay, obviously, you can't conclude anything from the language of the Mishnah. So let's see. Tashma. Beit kor afar ani mocher lecha. Mida bechevel. I'm selling you a beit kor of afar. Measure that exactly. And then there's no error, no nothing. Any bit of discrepancy goes back. Or again, in this case, the buyer would have to spend the money, pay the money to the seller for it, unless it's up to nine cups. Pachot koshu yinake, yeter koshu yachzi, right? If he gets a little less, the seller has to give him that extra amount. If she gets a little more, seller has to, has to um, the buyer has to give back that little amount extra. Hasta, or again, has to pay for it. Hastama, well, from there, what can you infer? That if you didn't say anything, you just said, bait kor, then hen chaser, ken chaser, hen yeter dami. Only if it's midah bechevel are we so exact. If you didn't say, I'm exacting, then obviously you wouldn't be. And that sounds reasonable. But the problem is the next line. Ema sefa, but then. Gemara contradicts this reasoning and says from the next line, you can actually infer the opposite. Because the next line says, marlo hen chaser hen yeter, Hastama dami. The next case said, well, there's a margin of error if you said more or less. Which sounds like if you didn't say anything, well then, there is no margin of error. So, therefore, from the two cases brought in the Mishnah, which each one was very particular, you can't infer anything about a case where you weren't particular in your language. We have no idea. So, attempt number one fails. Next attempt. Brighta. Tashma. Let's learn it from this Brighta. This Brighta is going to list three cases, and it's going to be very clear what the Halacha is in a Stam case, because the first case in this Brighta is a Stam case, where you didn't say anything other than Beit kor afal. Beit kor afal ani mocher lecha. I'm selling you a field the size of a beit kor, which is the case we're looking for. You didn't say midah bechevel. You didn't say more or less. Kid beit, case two. Kid beit kor afar ani mocher lecha. About a beit kor, okay? Like a beit kor, which sounds like give or take. Hen chaser hen yeter ani mocher lecha. Case three, more or less. And what do we say? If you're a little more, a little less, right? Meaning up to a quarter cup per se'ah, you got extra or got less. We leave it. Okay, there you have the halacha. Stam bait kor. You say bait kor afar ni without specifying anything. It's just like hen chaser hen yeter. And that's what the Gemara is going to conclude right now. Alma stam anami kehen chaser hen yeter dami. It must be more similar to that case as is explained in this Brighton. To which the Gemara tries to reject this proof, but in the end, they're going to accept it. The Gemara suggests, maybe we, re, maybe we misread the Brighton. Maybe it's really, the three cases aren't three cases. We thought it was three cases. Beit Korafal, Kibet Korafal, and Hen Chaser Hen Yeter. But maybe it's Perusha Kamafarish. It's all coming to define each other, meaning what? Ezehu beit kol, shehi ki beit kor. When do you have a sale of a beit kor where it's like a sale of approximately a beit kor? Kigon da amar lehen chaser hen yeter. And then case number one and case number two are actually not cases at all. It's beit kor afar ni mocher lechaim. What case would it be? Kid bait kor afar, which we saw was case number two. What case would it be like a bait kor, meaning it's not exactly exact, if you said the words hen chaser hen yeter? And then it actually would imply that if you'd said stam, it wouldn't be the case. Okay? And then that wouldn't be, wouldn't teach us anything. But Makifla Ravashi Ravashi says you can't possibly read the Brighta that way because look at the language of the Brighta. In ken ani mocher lach, lecha ani mocher lecha lamali. If you want to say that what it was really saying, when is a bait core like a kid bait core when you say the words hen chaser hen yeter, then it shouldn't have said, let's look at the words again, bait core afal ani mocher lecha. Okay, the first case is a bait core afal I am selling you. Kid bait core afal ani mocher lecha. Or you said, like a bait core I am selling you. In other words, if all this was one case, you wouldn't say each time, I am selling you, I am selling you. It really makes it sound like it's a quote from the mouth of the seller. And it's giving three different languages of, if you say, I'm selling you this, if you say, I'm selling you that, if you say, I'm selling you that. 
in which case it clearly is three cases, and therefore, Shmamina, El Alav Shmamina, after the only way to really read this is to conclude that Stama Nami Kehen Chaser Hein Yeter Dami Shmamina. So from here, we can basically conclude that it's Hein Chaser Hein Yeter and Stam are all the same. If you just said it's Stam, you didn't say anything, we assume you meant more or less, which if I had asked you in the beginning, you probably would have answered that that was the case because it makes sense. Right, midah b'chevel is when you said I'm being exacting. Otherwise, we assume there's a certain amount of mechila, as we call it, where each side said, oh, "Okay, I assume there's going to be a bit of an error, you know, a bit of a a, a differential here, and I'm okay with that." Ma'u machzir lo ma'ot. Now we're going to go to the line, and this is why I reviewed the entire Mishnah before, because we're going to really delve into each part of the Mishnah. What did we learn? That when it's between seven point six, you've already gone over the margin of error number, and you have to return all the surplus, you, between seven and a half, again, assuming we're in a bait course, seven and a half to nine, Kav, you basically, you can't, if you're this buyer, you can't return the land because the seller has nothing to do with that land. And the mission said it's liapot kochosha mochir, right? It's to strengthen, right? Lama amru machzir lama, oh, why does it say you have to then, the seller, the buyer has to pay the extra money so basically, I bought a big core, but I ended up with a big core plus eight extra kav. I have to pay the money for those eight extra kav. And I don't have a choice in the matter. The only way I don't have to return it is if the seller says I want it back. But otherwise, I can't return it. So the Gemara asks, Wait a minute. We only say that the mocher has the upper hand, the seller, and not the buyer. But wait, we're going to see a brighter where it seems that the choice of whether to buy or, or uh, either pay for it or return the land is actually up to the seller, the buyer. How do we see this? The Hatanya, the opposite of the Mishnah. Hatanya pichit shiva kabim lekor. Okay, that's our margin of error. If you got seven and a half kav less per core, or oh, hutir shiva kabim lekor, or you got seven and a half more than you should have. Higi oh, the sale is good and nothing happened. This is all what we've learned. But here, look at the language. Yoter mikam, but if you veered from that, it was too much surplus or too little, but we're going to focus on I as the buyer got too much. Kofin et hamocher linkor. I can force the seller. Okay, you already see the language. I have the upper hand. I can force the seller to sell me that extra land. In other words, if the seller says, I want the land back, and I say, I want to keep it, I'm allowed to. So what do you see here? I have the upper hand. And there could be cases where we force the buyer to buy, okay? But you see for sure here that the buyer has the upper hand and can force the seller to sell. So how can we explain that? So that seems to clearly contradict the Mishnah because the Mishnah says it's all up to the, the seller. And this Brita says it's up to the buyer and the seller, theoretically. The buyer has the power to force the, the seller's hand. To which the Gemara says, well, we're going to do what we call an ukimta. We're going to say that that breita is only in a unique situation. And it's not really talking about what you think. Okay, in the end, only the seller can decide if the seller wants to get the land back. Normally, the seller's not going to want the land back. Again, we're talking about this in between seven and a half to nine, where it's not actually a whole field. So the seller has the right to say, I insist that you buy it. I don't want this extra land back. But what is the buyer then when it said that the buyer can force the seller to sell? What does it mean? Well, let's understand first the situation and then we'll see what it means. Hatam kigon to have a yekira meikara vizal mehasha. This could sound a lot like Baba Metzia. All of a sudden there was a price change. Okay, what happened? The land, at the time I bought the land, the land was expensive. But when we measured and we realized that there was a surplus and now I'm forced to buy by, you're going to force me to buy that extra piece of land, the price of land has already gone down. So what does it mean? It doesn't mean I can force the seller to sell it to me if the seller doesn't want to. I don't have that power. The seller decides what they want to do with the land. Do they want it back or do they want to sell it? But I can force them to take the lower price of now and not have to pay the higher price it was at the time of the sale. Damrina, I can say to you, if you're going to give me land and make me keep this land, I'm only willing to pay the lower price as it is now. 
So now, so that's basically the way we resolve the contradiction between the bright and the Mishnah. The bright is not actually saying that the seller has the upper, that the buyer has the upper hand in general to decide whether to buy or whether to to um, whether to return the land or whether to buy it, but the seller can can decide that. But if the seller is forcing the buyer to buy, the buyer can, if the price has changed and the price is now lower, the buyer can insist on paying the lower price. And in that way, in that element only, the buyer has the upper hand. To which the Gemara says, wait a minute. The buyer can lock into the price it is now if the price went down, but wait. And doesn't have to pay the original price. The hatanya kashu no tenlo, no tenlo kashar shalakach mimenu. But it says in a different Braita that when the buyer pays, the buyer has to pay the price it was at the time of the sale. That seems to totally contradict what we just explained this bright as being. So as, as saying, to which the Gemara says, oh no, Hatam, that was talking about a different case. This is again, another Ukimta. That bright was talking about, Kegonda have a Zolami Karavi Yakarla Hashta. That's talking about the reverse case. When the price was lower in the beginning and now went up, at the time we measured and realized there was a surplus, the price is already higher, then the buyer can insist on the earlier price. So what do you see here? In the end, the conclusion is not only, okay, the buyer doesn't have the upper hand when it comes to deciding whether to buy or whether to return the land, that the seller, but the buyer has the upper hand in any type of price fluctuation. If the price went down, then the buyer can say, I'm only giving you the price at the current price. If the price went up, then the buyer can say, I'm only giving you the price it was at the time of the sale. So in terms of what the buyer has to pay, the buyer has the upper hand. But whether or not the buyer can pay or return the extra property, that the buyer has no rights to unless, and that's going to lead us to the next line, unless it's already nine kav. Once it gets to nine kav, and that's the law we saw in the Mishnah, then the buyer can say, I'm giving you back the land if the buyer wants. The buyer doesn't have to pay for it because it's already useful for the seller. And that's the next line. Shim Shier Basadeh, we're now just going back to that line in the Mishnah. Shier Basadeh Beit Tisha Kabin, right? Then already they can buy. Now, before we start on the Gemara on this, I'm going to point out the way we've been learning this and say that perhaps we're going to learn it a little differently. Now, we keep assuming that we're talking about a field that's a bait core. Okay, if we go back to our pictures, okay, I'll, I'll, pick them, I'll bring them up for another second. Okay, so it wasn't 100% clear. So our pictures, we're talking about a field of 30 core at seven and a half kav, which is basically all these red dots together, right? 30 times a quarter is, is seven and a half. At seven and a half kav, up to and including seven and a half kav, we assume there was mechila, they gave in. Once you get beyond seven and a half kav, we assume there's no mechila, that's called surplus. All of that theoretically goes back to the seller, but it doesn't go back because the seller can say, I don't want it back, just pay me the extra money. Okay, and the seller has to pay the extra money. Once you hit nine kav, so between 7.6 and nine, it, right, the, the, the buyer has, the seller has the upper hand to say, I don't want the land back, pay me the money. Once you get to nine, okay, once you're at nine, then obviously what happens, that's already a field, and then we can insist, right, the buyer wants to return it and doesn't want to buy it, they can say, take it back. This is a field. But now we're going to have a big debate, Rav Huna and Rav Nachman, about whether, and I'll tell you in very simple terms, whether this number nine kav in the Mishnah is an absolute number. No one gives in at nine kav. No one is mochel, a, a field that's nine kav, even if it's in a gigantic field, right? Now, we assume nine kav is nine kav if you're talking about a field of a core. What if it's two kolim? What if it's double the size? Now, with double the size, okay, if you look back at that picture, okay, you can imagine, it's just a little easier to imagine, I didn't write this out, but imagine the field was double the size. Now, if we add to the seven and a half and we get up to nine, you're not at a quarter kav per se, ah, right? You're obviously not because a quarter kav per se, ah, right? You're going to have to be 15 kav is going to have to be your margin of error here. So if you're at nine kav, what would we say? You can't, you don't return it. You don't do anything because it's part of, right? So if this field were double the size, you would think that at nine kav, the buyer doesn't return it. The buyer gets to keep it because there's dinu mechila, because proportionally, right, there's mechila. But Rav Huna doesn't view it that way. Rav Huna says nine kav is an absolute number. Even if it's a huge field, it could be 10 kolim of field. It doesn't matter. 
If you gave nine extra kav, nobody gives up on nine extra kav. And that's what we're going to read right now. Even in a gigantic field. It doesn't matter. As soon as the margin of error is a quarter kav per se, ah, up until nine kav. Once you hit nine kav, the quarter kav per se ah is an irrelevant fra- uh, fraction or um, an irrelevant proportion. We don't care anymore. Nine kav is a serious amount in any field. And therefore, it stands on its own. It's an absolute number. So it's proportional up until you get to nine kav. That's the idea. It's proportional to nine kav. Once you get to nine kav, that's such a significant amount, nobody would throw in an extra nine kav without, you know, by accident. Uh, sorry, on purpose. And, and no one's willing to be mochel on that amount. That's Rav Huna. Rav Nachman goes back to what we thought originally, which is it's all proportional. Rav Nachman says, Notein shiva kabim v'mechza l'kol kor v'kol. It's seven and a half per core. So double that, you know, double core, it's going to have to be 15. So at 15.5 or 15.1, the seller can say, I'm giving you back this 15.1 kav field. But under 15, you can't return it. You don't need to return it, actually. The buyer wins out. The buyer gets this extra 15 kav because that's all within the amount we assume a seller is mochen. So this is a very interesting debate, and you can understand why there would be such a debate because it's, it's really an interesting concept, which is, is it all proportional and keeps going up and up and up and up? Or is there a cutoff? Is there a cutoff? Where we say, of course, that, that's huge, right? I'm not going to give you something huge by accident. So that's the debate here. So let's keep reading Rav Nachman, turning now to Amabed. So he says, you get Sheva Kabin Vemechza for each core. Ve'i kamilti yetera litishat kabin hadre. And if when you do it all proportionally, you're beyond the margin of error, and you've reached nine kav, you need two things. You need to be beyond the margin of error, and which is that proportion, and get up to nine kav, then the buyer can insist on returning the piece of land. So A to B, Rav Le Rav Nachman. Rav is going to bring three difficulties on Rav Nachman from our Mishnah, which we're going to easily resolve. He says, look at the Mishnah. The Mishnah says, She'im she'er basadeh be'tisha kabin. It said, if you have, right, you give an extra nine kav, and it didn't say in what size field. So comes Rava and assumes, lav de zabin le korayim, Sounds like nine kav is the magic number. Should be irrelevant whether it's a core or kurayim. Kurayim is two core, right? Whether it's two core, it sounds like nine kav is your number no matter what the size of the field is. To which Rav Nachman simply answers, no, tizab and kor. No, what do you mean? First of all, Rav Nachman has good reason to say so because the Mishnah was talking about a big kor afal, right? So Rav Nachman says the Mishnah would meant nine kav when the field is a core. When the field is two korim, it'll be 15 and a bit, right? So... That doesn't really contradict. Now we're going to do the same thing with the next two cases on the mission. If you remember, the mission is set up. If it's a field, it's a bait core. I, I'm sorry, it's nine kaf. That's the cutoff where the it's already significant. If it's a gina garden, then it's going to be either half a kaf, right, sorry, half a right, half a kaf or a quarter kaf. So the um, so the Gemara is going to also assume they're going to try to do the same proportion here. When they, when Rava asks this question, it says ubigina beit chatsi kav lav dezabin le sataim. Again, the Rava is going to assume they must mean right, even if it's not right. That it's, again, it's the simple reading. It, it's actually hard to understand what the simple reading is, but it sounds like once it's a chatsi kav, a half a kav, it doesn't matter if the field is doesn't matter what size the field is. So he says, isn't it, let's say, in two se'a? Now, what's the proportion? Okay, let's just go back to our picture for a minute. Okay, if it, this is actually pretty easy. If it's a quarter kav for one se'a, right, which is this one in 24, then half of, and that we say, there's still mechila, right? That's an amount that we let go. And a half a kav, if you give a half a cup extra when you were selling a gina, out of what's Rava assuming? Two se'a. Now, half a cup, a uh, quarter cup for one se'a, double a quarter and double one, you get to a half a cup for two se'a. 
So half a cover two sal would be this exact same proportion, one in 24. And according to what, right, according to this, what will we say? That would be mechila. You wouldn't give it back. And what does it say here? When it's beichatzi kav, you give it back. So it seems to imply that it's all an absolute number. As long as it's a chatzi kav and has significance, you have to give it back. To which they say, <coughs> why are you saying this is within the margin of error? Why don't you just assume, lo, de zabin le se'ah. The sale was for a se'ah. Half a kav out of a se'ah, that's already, right, one in 12, not one in 24. In which case, well, that's obviously beyond the margin of error. And then it's all proportional. And that's how Rav Nachman explains his, his relative argument. His, that's all according to the proportion. Well, last question, which is going to be the same type question. Now, a quarter se'ah according to Rabbi Akiva. If you've erred a quarter se'ah, since a quarter se'ah in a garden is already, according to Rabbi Akiva, considered a garden, you can return that whole quarter se'ah. Now, quarter se'ah would be, right, we're going to assume my lav de zav le se'ah. Rabbi says it must be a quarter kav of error in a field that was sold for, that you sold a se'ah or a garden that you sold a se'ah's worth of. Now, a quarter kav per se'ah, that's our measurement that we say was within the margin of error. It's the exact border, but it's within the margin of error. And yet, what does the Mishnah say? You can return it. Sounds like it's an absolute number. To which again, lo, does abin le'chatzi se'ah. Now, you could say it's a quarter kav if the whole sale was about half a se'ah. In other words, each time you just find a proportion that works where this will be beyond the margin of error. And this will be, you know, a, a major surplus that the, that the buyer got that we can make the, then the buyer can say, look, I'm returning this because again, the amount of error was proportional beyond the margin of error and it's the minimum amount for a garden. So you can actually return it. And therefore we end up with no real question on Rav Nachman. Both of them could be read into the Mishnah. So again, is it absolute number, this nine kav, or chatzik kav, or reva kav for the garden, or is it a relative number? And again, you're only going to be able to return it if it's beyond the margin of error of the quarter kav per se a uh, proportion. By Rav Ashi. Rav Ashi asks another question. Now we said that in a field you can return it if you've gotten to nine kav. But if it's a garden, you can return it already at a half a kav or a quarter kav, depending on whether you're Rabbi Akiva or not or you hold by Rabbi Akiva or not. But what if, Rav Ashi asks, what if when I bought it, it was a field, but then it became potentially used as a garden, okay? Once, and as once we realize that there's too much there, there's a surplus, and we've gotten beyond the amount that's a surplus, and now I want to return it to you, and let's say we're at eight and a half cuff, okay? Or eight cuff. So if it's a field, I can't, I can't insist on returning it to you. I have to pay the extra money. But if now, when we realize that I got eight kava extra, it now potentially could be used as a garden. What's the difference? Well, let's say all of a sudden a river started flowing through. The river overflowed and now goes through my, my this field. So now it actually could be used as a garden because it has a source of water there. Since that's the case, Rabashi wants to know, well, now that it's eight kava of surplus, if it's a garden, that's already, I can return it to you because it could be used as a garden for you. And that already has significance because even at a half a cup, it could be used as a garden. So for sure, eight cup. Or, or what if it's the reverse? What if it was a garden first? And then, right, I could return you any little amount, but then the, the riverbed dried up. And now it has no water source and it can only be used as a field. So if I return it to you, let's say it was five cup, I return it to you, but, right, for a garden that was, you know, that was, uh, that was within the amount because more than a half, a half a cup or more than a quarter cup. But as a field, it's useless. And now it happens to be a field. But at the time of the sale, it was a garden. So what do we go by? The time, right, from the original or from now? And the answer is take We don't have an answer to that question. Okay? No one knows the answer to Rav Ash's question. And moving on. Another issue. Now, well, we said that if it's between seven and a half kav and nine, let's just assume we're talking about a bait core, between seven and a half and nine, I can't, or between 7.6, basically there's a surplus, I have to pay the money, I can't return you the field because what are you gonna do with it? There's one exception to that rule. 
which is Tana Imayas the Brighter says, Imayas Samuchli Sadeu, Afilu Koshu, Machzir, Afilu Koshu Machzir Lo Karka. If it was next to your field, even a little small amount I can return to you because if, let's say, you sold me the adjacent field. So now, if I want to return you something, you live right next door. So basically, I can give you back a little portion because it'll be attached to your field and it'll just make your field a little bigger. The whole problem is what are you going to do with a little piece of land that's useless? But if I'm giving you back, now this word culture is a little confusing because it's not any little amount. It has to be more than seven and a half core. If it's not more than seven and a half, I'm sorry, kav. If it's not more than seven and a half kav, then, then basically... It, we assumed you were giving it to me, and that was okay. That was margin of error. We're talking here, though, once it's beyond 7.5 kav, it doesn't matter if it's 7.6, if it's 7.8, if it's, right? Any amount, even if it's less than 9, that's the main thing, you have what to do with because it's just attached to your field. You'll plow it along with your field and all that. And therefore, I can actually return it to you. And I can insist that I don't want to buy it. I'm just going to give it back to you. Now, the, again, Rav Ashi asks a question, which we're not going to have an answer to. By Rav Ashi, Bor ma'u shetafsik, amatamay ma'u shetafsik, derech harabi ma'u shetafsik, and rich bedidikla ma'u shetafsik. Well, we said that if it's next to your field, I can return it to you because you can plow it along with your field. So what if there's a separation between your field? It's right next to your field, but there happens to be a pit in between this piece of land I want to return you and your field. Or more bothersome than a pit is an Amat Hamayim, a water channel. Or, even more bothersome than that, a Derech HaRabim, there's a public path that people walk through. Okay, they say it's not really Rashid HaRabim, that for sure would be a separation, but it's a path that's wide like Rashid HaRabim and people pass through. Or, there's a row of palm trees. And that's separating this land from your land. Will we say then that that's adjacent or not? Is that considered enough of a separation? to say, no, it's really wholly inconvenient for you to get this little piece of land on the other side of the pit or on the other side of the, of the road. And the Gemara, the Gemara answers take it. We don't have an answer to this question. Okay, two last things to finish up for today. One is this last line in the Mishnah, which we said was a little confusing and didn't make sense. Once you get past the 7.5 kav per se'ah, lo et rova bilva machsir, you don't just return the quarter kav extra, ela kola motar, but all the surplus. Now, it's a little bit klapelaya. This sounds the opposite. You weren't returning the quarters. You were returning the surplus, the extra, the, the 0.1, right? Let's say you're at 7.6. So the 0.1 is the surplus. All the rivaim is the 7.5 until that point. It doesn't make sense. Don't return only the 7.5, also the surplus. It should be the reverse, to which Tani Ravin Barav Nachman, Ravin reads the Mishnah differently and says, no, there's a mistake here. Lo etamotar bilvad machzir. You don't only return the surplus. What's beyond the seven and a half? Ela et kola riva in kulam. You return all the quarter calves of error that were before that you, we said was kind of just okay. And, and, and the seller said, I don't care about them. But once you go over, you return everything. And this was the part of the suga that we quoted back on, I'll see, never on Sadi Dalit Amabet, where we were talking about what well, we assume when I buy something. I accept certain psole, the garbage, you know, extras or bad stuff. I accept a certain amount, right? But once you go over that amount, then basically it all, all gets returned. So likewise here. Okay, now we're going to start a new Mishnah, and we'll, we'll learn the Mishnah for today, and tomorrow we'll really deal with it and, and delve into it in the Gabara. Mida b'chevel ani mocher l'cha, just like the case we just saw, sells, the seller says, I'm selling it to you exact measurement. Hein chaser hein yeter, more or less. Okay, this is a very confusing thing. This is like, you know, which way do you go? And you point, you know, in both directions, right? Which way am I supposed to go? And so, you know, I'm, I want, I'm selling you an exact measurement. I'm selling it to you more or less. Batel hein chaser hein yeter midah b'chevel. Your last words you said, hein chaser hein yeter, that basically overrides the first words you said. And this sounds similar to things we learned in the past, which is if you say something, we learned it in Nadarim, and it probably came up, I don't remember, but probably Nazir and all these cases where you use two different, you say something and then you say something contradictory, What? which one do we take? So according to the Mishnah, Hein chaser hein yeter cancels out midah b'cheva. Hein the assumption is what? That when you said the second phrase, you kind of changed your mind about what you said in the beginning. First, you said, I'm going to measure it exactly. And then you said, ah, you know what? We'll do more or less. 
And likewise, hein chaser, hein yete. This has something to do with which one you said first. If you started with the more or less, and then you said midah bechevel, I'm going to measure it out with a with a rope. Batil midah bechevel, hein chaser, hein yete. We go by again. The last thing you said nullifies the first thing you said, and therefore we're going to go with midah bechevel. Divrei ben nanas. This is what ben nanas holds. The Mishnah brings one opinion, but we'll see immediately in the Gemara tomorrow that the rabbis disagree with Ben Namas. And we'll get to that in tomorrow's stuff. So what did we do today? We talked about the difference between Midah B'chevel and and Hen Chaser Hen Yeter, which we also ended with, although there we were really just dealing with contradictory statements that you made and which one, come, you know, which one we go by, the first thing you said or the second. But the difference is that there's no error, no no assumption, no leeway for a margin of error in the case of Bidah Bechevel, rather than in the case of more or less, where we assume a margin of error. What's the margin of error? Quarter kaf per se'a, which goes to, if it's a bait core, seven and a half kaf. At that amount, nothing happens. Above that, until you get to nine kaf, we say the buyer has to pay the money for the entire amount of the surplus. Once you get to nine kaf, the buyer can return the land. In the first case, 7.6 to, or 7.51 to 9, the seller can decide if to get the land back or if to sell. But it's all, or if to, right, if to make the buyer buy it. But beyond that, the buyer can insist take back the land because that's already a significant piece of land. And then we saw the amount also for a garden, also for that. And then we got into number one, what about a case stump where you didn't say Midab Chevel and you didn't say, um, you didn't say midah bechevel, you didn't say more or less. And then we said it's really like more or less. And then we got to, are we always giving the power to the buyer, uh, to the seller? Didn't we say that right between seven and a half and nine that the seller can decide? What about this mission that seems to, the bright that seems to imply the buyer can decide? To which we said, no, the buyer can't decide whether to buy or sell. The buyer, or return the land, um, sorry, to buy or return the land. But the buyer can decide on the price if there was a price fluctuation. That was how we reconciled the problem with the Breitah. Then we got to the big machlok at Rav Huna and Rav Nachman. Very interesting about this nine cobs is it relative or absolute? We brought three difficulties with Rav Nachman who said it was relative from the mission itself, but we resolved all the contradictions. It wasn't such clear, contrad- they weren't so clear contrad- such clear contradictions. Then we had Rav Ashi who asked this question, what if a Sadeh turned to a Gina and a Gina turned to a Sadeh by the time you realize there was a surplus? Does that change things or not in terms of this amount that the buyer can insist on returning you the property? We didn't have an answer. Then we said, you can return it if it's adjacent. But again, Rav Ashi asked some questions. What if there was something blocking, like a pit or a bunch of other things? Then we fixed that line, that last line in the mission, which really seemed to be opposite of what it said, that the rova and the motar flip places. And we explained that line, kind of how we explained it when we got to it in the Mishnah. And then we got to this other Mishnah about contradicting your words and which we go by the first thing you said or the last thing. And we saw the bananas hold by whatever you said at the end must be what you meant. That's the end for today. Wishing everybody a meaningful day. Um, you know, we have two way, two days this year to, to remember October 7th and on some So this will be the beginning of the, um, the this stage of reaching a year from uh, when this all started. Wishing everyone a good day and a safe day.